So welcome everyone for this fourth edition of Jogo Live, which is an event hosted by Just One Giant Plan. Today, we are really happy to host the Do It Together SARS Cov Detective, alias uh, the Corona Detective Project, and many of uh, its members. So very briefly about what's going to happen. We're going to have a 10 to 20 minute uh, presentation from Rachel and Guy here. Um, and that, that will be followed by question and answer. So it means to be very collaborative, very open. So feel free to ask questions, to make suggestions, and uh, just share your thoughts. Um, before we start, I'd like to give you a bit of a background on what is Juggle Life. If I manage to yes, change slide. Oh, and before that, I just wanted, I just wanted to show this picture of the team, which I and to tell you like this project is one of the oldest, uh, the one that is the most, the most active uh, project of the online team initiative. And just want to stress that we're really, really happy to have this conversation with you today. I see my connection is in I just turn off my camera. About Juggle is one of the many ways that Juggle supports uh, its community and the projects within it. Basically, it's one hour to um, provide visibility to one project and trying to foster the collaboration around it. So it's very, uh, I would say, open, uh, it has to be energetic, and we really hope to see some collaboration getting out of it. And for the one who wondered what is Just One Giant Lab, as we had the question before, Just One Giant Lab, first it's an NGO, and we work um, based on a collaborative platform uh, which is powered by more than four Southern uh, contributors uh, working together hand in hand on project to achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, so these people are students, researchers, data scientists, designers. Uh, if you want to check out the platform uh, we build, you can visit the app.juggle.io, uh, but you can also like contact me if you have any question. So back to today's topic, we're gonna talk, of course, about COVID testing and detection methods that are open source, easy to use, low cost. Um, we're going to talk about do it together, do it yourself biology. And, um, and for that, like we have, of course, the many members of the, of the Corona Detective team, but I think our speakers today are gonna be Rachel Aronoff and Guy Edelberg. So I just want to introduce uh, them to you briefly. Uh, Rachel is the founder of Agir, Action for Genomic Integrity Through Research, and the president of the Swiss Public Laboratory Association called Aquarium. She is a molecular microbiologist and geneticist and keen on participatory science for all. Guy is a lifelong traveler, learner, and explorer. As a scientist, he's developing an open, affordable, reliable, easy to use, rapid, and robust, a lot, <laughs> kit for DNA detection by non-scientists at the Center for Research and Inter Interdisciplinarity in Paris, under the supervision of Aria Linder. So I, I let the mic and the screen to you both um, thanks again for being here today, and I can't wait uh, to see what we come to. Let me stop sharing my screen, and maybe do you want, um, I can handle it to you. Are you able to share your screen, or should I? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much, Camille, for the um, <laughs> introduction and everything, and yeah, I'll try and share the screen. Um, I should open this one. Oh, but I shouldn't go full screen yet. <laughs> um, I think. So is that sharing now with? Yes. Yeah. So 
we have this um, Prezi, which includes quite a lot more than what we'll talk about, um, but we thought it would be really good to give a little bit of background because, of course, all of us have a lot of um, projects that are very dear to our hearts, um, in addition to working to get um, past this whole time of corona. Um, but I'm really glad that we can, um, we've gotten together and um, are able to talk to you today about DIT research in the time of COVID-19. So um, DIT, of course, stands for do it together, which we think is a lot more fun than doing it by yourself because <laughs> the DIY bio um, and biohackers have gotten a lot of press sometimes and Hackwarium, the open public lab where I'm president of the association, of course, it was built around the idea of biohacking and DIY bio, but it's really not like hacking in the way of taking um, somebody's identity or things like that. We have a code of ethics and we try really to make the world a better place and democratize research for everyone. So, um, of course, uh, I could spend a lot of time talking about my interest in what I call genomic integrity, which is basically the a short phrase for the thousands of molecular interactions and in the dynamics going on inside of our cells, not just DNA set in stone, but RNAs, um, epigenetics, uh, all this nice stuff. The, the picture behind me is supposed to be a nucleosome from some of Drew Barry's work. Um, a set of three nucleosomes. And um, so if anybody wants to go back and look further and find out more about that DIT bio for genomic integrity, they can just go on further through this Prezi. But um, for now, Guy and I will mainly be talking about our project at Jogal and the Do It Together SARS-CoV-2 detective. So Guy um, had developed the GMO detective to look for um, genetically modified organisms in food stuff where maybe it's not always listed on the ingredient list that it was a transgenic soybean, for instance, or a transgenic corn. And um, for the fifth year birthday party of Hackwarium in the fall a year ago, uh, he came and gave his workshop. And actually um, this picture below shows his detector with, I'll tell you more details about it later, about our um, method to look for coronavirus. So of course, all this would never have happened without the support of the Open COVID-19 Initiative that's part of JOGO. And um, Thomas Landrin had phoned me as president of Hackwarium, just, do you want to get involved in our corona stuff? And I was very glad to have this opportunity. And it's really been quite nice. Um, to join together on this international collaboration. So this just shows the front end project on the, um, the Jogal app. And um, there's some details in there and people can join in. Um, but one big question, I, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background and then show you where we are on the results. And it's really Guy who's going to be doing the hard work of freeze drying our kits to mail them off because the main idea of the corona detective is that you can ship the tubes that have all the reaction reagents um, freeze-dried, no cold chain dependence. And initially we thought we would only be using it for envir environmental monitoring because especially at Hackwarium, we only have a P1 lab. We don't, we don't want to work with clinical samples at all. But um, it looks so sensitive and robust, we think most likely it'll work well for um, things like clinical diagnostics or maybe the early stages of just trying to do lots of tests for the virus. So, so here's the background. How can a virus be detected? Well, basically, um, viruses are um, a mass of molecules, right? So there's the RNA genome wrapped up with the nucleocapsid protein. The coronavirus is an envelope virus, so there's a lipid bilayer, and there are protein um, spikes uh, embedded in that and other proteins that are important for pathogenesis by the virus. And um, all of these molecules can be used as means for detection. And there's even physical properties of the particles that can be used with electrochemistry 
to um, to actually detect the virus. So there's a guy in Israel now who has a sort of breathalyzer that's just looking for the particles, just like that, as particles. But um, usually, in terms of seeing a virus and being able to detect it reliably, we use some things called amplification strategies. So for people who are here that are part of the Jogel Slack, you know we have a project nucleic acid detection that includes at least three, maybe, maybe five projects that are um, important for detecting the virus. And, and we're all sort of all working together. But um, these amplification strategies have to start from the RNA genome of the virus and make it back into DNA using reverse transcription. So there's at least two enzymes we use for the amplification, um, the reverse transcriptase and the polymerase that's gonna make the DNA molecules that get detected. And so now it's Guy's turn to talk. Um, so we really weren't sure about the audience, but is there anybody who doesn't know how PCR works? Because it seems like everybody here is biologists. So I if, guess we if can. You, if you don't, you can click on the, there is a yes, no button on the, um, on the chat. Yeah, you can yeah. click here. Or you can talk. But... Or forever hold your peace or look it up on Wikipedia where this is from. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, so we can, we can keep going. So we don't, we don't use PCR. We use something similar um, okay. that's called LAMP. Uh, so PCR, people have been trying to make it cheaper, but it's still relatively expensive and complicated. So we use something called loop-mediated isothermal amplification, which is LAMP, which only needs one temperature. Um, it also has some other advantages that it's usually faster, and um, it's many times very specific because it uses six primers and not two. And there are lots of different ways to detect LAMP reactions happening. Um, but there are also some disadvantages of LAMP, which is that it's harder to design the primers. Um, most of the detection methods are not sequence specific. It's a little harder to multiplex than PCR. And the LAMP, the LAMP products are not as suitable for downstream things. Um, especially because they can cause cross-contamination issues. Yeah. No, especially it makes at least like 10 times more DNA than PCR, which if you open the tubes, then we can get everywhere. Um, yeah, so if you're new to LAMP, that was one of the reasons we went in there right away and said, oh, the, all these people are going to try isothermal amplification. They should know about some of the risks as well as the benefits. Yeah. Um, and then when you do one of these reactions, there's sort of two different ways to, to look at them. You can look at the end and see if what you if what you are trying to amplify is there, or you can also you can on the right you can see like real time detections, which means following the reaction as it's happening, and then you can see the dynamics. And then, the, as I was saying, like so, there's lots of different ways to kind of visualize lamp detection. So the you can see the fourth one, this phenol red is like a pH dye, and then that we were talking before about this N H and B dye, and then there's also Sort of fluorescent waves. Um, there will be a link to the presentation after here. Yeah. Um, next one. Mm -hmm. So the way that we're doing the detection is something called quasar, which basically you tag one of these primers with a fluorescent molecule, and you also have a short complementary um, primer with a quencher. So you run the reaction, and, and if there's no amplification, this quencher sticks to the primer, and then it's, it's dark. But if the amplification happened, then this quencher can't stick, and then you get bright, positive reactions that are easy to detect. And it also allows multiplexing and gives some sequence specificity. Um, and this came out a few years ago. It hasn't been used a lot, but yeah. We really like it. Also, Ali on this call is using it and likes it a lot. We think it works better than most lamp detection methods. But in their paper, their detector cost almost $100. And we've developed one that's less than two. That's the next slide. 
Yeah. So it's just really simple that anybody can kind of build themselves or fix. And it's just some LEDs and some filters. And this allows you to really see the fluorescence very easily. Um, so sorry, can I just ask what, sure. what kind of filters are they? Um, they? These are like plastic gel filters um, for like filming and things like that. So like a, like a, meter, squ a meter square is $2. All right. Because the ones I use are like a couple of hundred dollars. Exactly. So this allows you to do it much, much, much cheaper. So is it just like a standard piece of plastic sheet you buy that's it's covered? Like, or is it a yeah, exactly. It's like, a, it, it's thin. It's like a gel filter. It's like for lighting, like what they put on lights on TV shows or right. right at the theater, yeah, production. theater productions or things like that. Okay. That's it. Um, and they have very precise, like kind of, yeah, optical. Um, you can see more on, on the gmodetective.com on their website. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like um, not any, but most pro photography stores will have them, exactly. Uh, so yeah, you can take it away, Rachel. Okay, I'll go on. So then, um, so, so this image actually shows one of the sets of results from the workshop that Guy did last October in Aquarium for its uh, five-year birthday party. And so basically, there were four tubes for the control gene target, which was a plant gene, and the transgene target gene. Um, so each of them have the sets of um, primers and the tag and the quencher for the correct targets. And then there's a non-template control for each of the four. There's a positive control for each of the four and then two extracts that you have here. So you can see, even though both of the extractions were quite good, the, neither of them were transgenic. Um, the positive control guy used, I think, was Kellogg's cornflakes, which is full of the GMO. Um, but um, it was, I mean, you can, I just took the picture with my telephone. You can see it sort of reflected there, but it's quite simple to see the difference between the positive and the negative. And the amazing thing about these reactions, again, is that all the components can be freeze dried. So you can ship them anywhere with no cold chain dependence. And so we started out this project, I guess it was early in April that we put up that front end web page about the project and asked for some funding. Um, we said, can we make a corona detective that will detect this virus? And indeed, it looks like we're gonna be able to. Um, but one thing we were really keen on doing is to get the multiplex to work. So if you can get both of the targets to be detected in a single reaction tube, which would mean you have 12 primers for the two targets plus the two different quenchers, um, so 14 little primers in your reaction, plus the two different enzymes and the salts and so on. And then for an eight tube strip, you could actually get five test samples for one eight tube strip, which is a lot better than only two samples. So um, I guess I can just tell you already the multiplex did work, but it was a tour de force for open science because we hacked a really old machine to make it work. In fact, at first we could only get these little tips of our results with um, Sam from uh, another association that was born as a project within Hackwarium. We got the machine to at least bend to our will. So we could test a bunch of primers for um, control genes and for viral genes. So there's the, the nucleocapsid, were two sets of target primers we used here. And um, because it was only cell RNA that was input here, I was very glad that none of the viral uh, products came up in this reaction. But this just shows how the fluorescence comes up in the real time machine. Just, I took it, the tips and I got the, the quantitation um, manually. But basically the actin gene came up at about 25 minutes. The RNAs P gene came up in around a half hour, but the, actin actually had this one false positive, which I didn't like. <laughs> and so um, I decided RNASP was a better internal control gene than the other one. 
And when we got the machine actually calibrated, we actually got it to run as a real real time machine should run, where you see the, um, the program does it and you get a nice smooth curve of the increase in fluorescence. And this just shows um, results after a bunch of different titrations of different um, control plates and different levels of magnesium and also changing the ratios of one primer pair to the other can make a big difference in the efficiency. But here you can see with the sort of more turbocharged enzyme, BST2, the um, positive product came up within 17 minutes versus with the old school BST, um, which is out of, it's no longer protected by IP, um, that came up just a few minutes slower, four minutes slower, 21 minutes. Um, so again, this is just cycle numbers from the program. So every two minutes, there's another um, cycle. And um, there were three minutes at the start that were counted. So that's how we convert the cycle numbers to time to product. Um, but again, you can see here the old school BST, um, the water control stays negative all the way across. But here with the BST2, even the water comes up a bit. And one of our swabs, so I was a bit worried the swabs are coming up because we thought we were going to mainly do environmental monitoring with this at first. But um, anyway, uh, that was with a DNA controlled plasmid. And more important, as it's an RNA virus, we wanted to make sure that the reverse transcription step worked. And so here you can see that the synthetic RNA could also be very well detected by these primer pairs. And um, at the endpoint TIF, we're just going back to our um, original uh, machine, you can see that when you have the old school uh, BSTO with the reverse transcription, you get very good signal with the RNAs and with the DNA, but the water stays low. While the BST2, you can see the water is giving signal. And we don't want to have false positives. I, I don't really know which is worse, false positives or false negatives. But anyway, the important thing is that we did manage to show that you could get down to 20 copies of the synthetic RNA in our reaction conditions. And um, we think that's pretty good. So what about the quasar for detection? Indeed, when we had the nucleocapsid primers that tagged with the FAM fluorescein um, tag with the quencher, the water um, control stays negative and the RNAs come up very well. This is at the end of the reaction. Of course, over time, the RNA 200 tubes came up first before the RNA 20. But um, in this case, we were doing some tests with saliva and the saliva pretty much killed the reaction, raw saliva. But if you um, do other treatments, there are ways to um, use saliva samples. And in addition to the viral target, we can very well see the internal control of the RNAs P. And here you see everything else stays pretty, uh, the, the water and the viral RNA um, stay negative, but the cell RNA comes up very well in the mix of the cell RNA and the viral wasn't perfect but um, they might have been a little bit in this too. But overall, um, we think um, we have a very sensitive method. And here you can see the turbidity detection also for the second tubes, because as the polymerase moves along and makes the DNA product, uh, there's magnesium and you end up with turbidity. That's also a measure of the, the readout. And so here is the very good result that we got. Um, a few weeks ago now, where the multiplex indeed, where you mix all the, the N target and the RNAs P target together, one's labeled with the FAM, the other one with the HEX, you get the RNA for the virus coming up, the cell RNA coming up, and both of them come up. The extra thing I had to do, and it really does look like it makes a difference, because I, well, I'll tell you more in a second, was that having something that protects against degradation of the RNA is very important to have in the master mixes and an extra incubation at a lower temperature for the reverse transcription was very helpful to give this positive result. So in summary, for those first successful multiplex attempts, by 15 minutes, we were already getting the viral synthetic RNA coming up. 
by 20 minutes, the cell RNA was coming up with the more turbocharged enzyme in a half hour. The um, old school enzyme was getting the viral target. And by 35 minutes, the, the tube with the multiplex was looking really good. But at first, I didn't get a good result with the um, old school enzyme yet. But now, after some more multiplex tests with and without that extra 10 minute step, which definitely seems worthwhile. Um, we also got the old school PSTO, um, uh, the large fragment to um, work for this um, multiplex. So we have more primer sets for viral targets like the LAM or targets and controls for 18S and 16S. And we've already gotten some good application, amplification for the viral targets, but the RNA specificity for these 18S and 16S nest controls is very questionable. Um, it seems like without the reverse transcriptase was a bit better than with. Um, and more is going on in Paris with that. And so we've got a lot more DIT research ahead. Here's some emails if you want to contact us and ask more questions after, if you think of it after we finish our discussion now. And this is the picture you already saw from Camille with members of the team. Um, we're really excited because we're going to be sending these tubes off when we've chosen our favorite sets to um, Cameroon, to Chile, and um, Sri Lanka. And um, it's going to be really great to find out, especially for the people who have access to DSL2 labs, um, how, uh, how everything works and if they get validated and become the super test that goes everywhere. And of course, we're doing everything open source. so. Um, anyone could try and recreate this and, and go on and make more of the same. Are there any questions? I'll stop sharing my screen or should I leave it on? Well, leave maybe it. you can leave it on if people have questions. I know, Andrew, you had one about treating the both multiplex reaction. Yeah, I think that was answered, though. So that was answered. Oh, sorry. Uh, Thank can you. I ask what? Oh, sure. Yeah. Can I ask what um, what protocol you're using to do the RNA extraction? Yeah. So actually, um, for the cell RNA that I've used so far, I only used just the Monarch kit from NAB for the extraction. But for real clinical samples, um, also from our collaborators' work. It looks like um, using glass milk and sodium iodide is a very good method. Um, okay. And I think also the group from, um, from Vienna had good luck using these magnetic beads. Mm. So both okay. glass milk and the magnetic beads are very good for the extraction. And um, even the beads can be inside the reaction and, and doesn't interfere with detection. Yeah, the group from Vienna was using was doing it with the beads and then putting the lamp reactions on top of that. Mm -hmm. And that seems to work well. And they, they also say that they can make their own beads and that makes it cheap. Because the idea is to get away from these commercial kits because the whole world is running low and they're extremely expensive. And the shipping is just always crazy when you want to get all around the world and it's coming from Boston or something. Um, hi guys, I've just got a quick question about the primer process. So you guys said that because of the lamp method, um, this is actually the first time I've heard of it. And um, the fact that the primers, because you needed so many primers, and I was wondering why it was less specific than the two primer process, because you said you get a lot of DNA from it. it it's actually more specific, but it's a smaller target area. So okay. really, it's more the, bigger. The it can be, primers. it can also be, a, yeah. It, I mean, uh, the amplicon can be bigger or smaller, but yeah, it's targeting sort of two to f like four to six different regions of the. Mm. Oh, so it's kind of like, so it's kind of like, for example, you know, it's like the M1 and P, whatever. So it's kind of targeting them all at the same time? Yes. Yeah, there's sort of a, a weird set where there's actually two primers that don't end up being incorporated in the amplicon at all. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the four, two of the primers actually are sort of bipartite primers with one side that's sense and the other side that's anti-sense. 
and the molecule that's made is really a sort of concatamer that's super stable. And that's the other reason why we really thought we should warn people not to open their tubes at the end of the reaction so they, they would just cross contamination issues. But there is also an enzymatic way to get around this cross contamination problem where you incorporate UDP in the reaction, and then there's another enzyme that chews up everything that has UDP. And um, I, the Vienna group is also using that. The Vienna group's um, uh, preprint is really one of the most beautiful ones that's come out in these last few months, I'd say, that talks about all of this. Mm, I see. And so you guys started working on this like lamp method because of, to get around the idea that PCR was expensive and so inaccessible, right? Um, yeah, yeah, it's really easy because you can just incubate it. In, you can have boiled water and put your tube, oh. and that's and you can yeah. get a good reaction. Ah, there was a there was a heating slide we missed, but yeah, um, I I started doing this. The whole thing was to democratize it, and we've been doing it. I mean, with high schools a lot, mm -hmm. and with like um, even younger kids and older people and things like that. So we really did get it so that anybody can do it. Try to make it as simple as and cheap as possible. Here's the heating slide. So yeah, like usually when I do like um, big workshops, I use this like sous vide machine that you can see like down in the middle and the bottom. One. So this thing is uh, the red one. One hundred. This thing no, here. The one in the middle. So it's oh, okay. it's like fifty two hundred bucks, and it can keep a really stable temperature, and you can do like uh, hundreds and thousands of reactions with that. I see. So that's like way simpler and cheaper than. Because um, so I I'm currently interning with a company called Open Cell. And yeah, yeah. put in this like small pocket PCR machine. Like um, in, you mean open cell in London? Yeah, yeah. People, okay, yeah. And I know, I know, um, I they have this like tiny PCR machine. I think it's like ninety nine, and it runs five samples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And pocket I've had a PCR. good one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, if you, if you look on YouTube, if you search like what's a pocket yeah, yeah. PCR, I've, yeah. I've done a video on it. No, we, we, we know all these people. Like, we, yeah, yeah. We it's a Swiss biohacker yeah, yeah. who made the pocket PCR. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Gaffy Labs, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, so, I mean, what would you guys think um, comparing the pocket PCR so to for, the lab? Fernan in Chile is doing this now, is going to do this now with his students, I think. Oh, amazing. Even. So that's already kind of happening. But mm. yeah, the, but so the thing about this is that it, it's kind of even cheaper and can do like thousands of reactions and that can do only kind of five. I see. Yeah, because it's like every time you run like yeah. eight in one strip. Yeah, exactly. And there you need to put five individual tubes and then you need to put oil on top too because there's no like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On yeah. top. Pretty but tricky. It's <laughs> it, it, as a very cheap, like simple PCR machine. It's super cool. Mm. The other thing that's really nice is that Guy doesn't only have to stick to the 8-2 format. Yeah, he can yeah. go ahead and make 96 well plates that have everything. So then we could have four. the three control wells and then have 93 samples all in one. But we would need more of a plate reader for that. Yeah. But I, also have that's I, I, have, I have a version that's basically a plate reader too. Mm -hmm. It's already built. Yeah. With the filters too? Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, for example, like if I was to like try and replicate this, is, do you think it's something that's possible to do like at home kind of thing? Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> like I mean, buy, buying the enzymes and stuff and primers and stuff. I see. A little yeah, messy. That would be tricky. Mm. But the idea yeah, is that we would freeze dry them and then we can send them out to anybody. Oh. That makes it simpler. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then our, all our collaborators, whoever wanted to, could freeze dry and send them out too. Yeah, so could, you, could you maybe order. elaborate on, on this, like how you can send them everywhere and, <laughs> <laughs> and so how can people test it and where they can test it? So Guy has the robotics, so I think Guy should talk about this. Um, what exactly? So I, I, I'm not sure that I understand exactly what the question is. For making um, the tubes and sending them off everywhere. Because um, you have the robotic system. Yeah, so we have robots that can easily like make lots and lots of plates and we also have a big freeze dryer. So we can make thousands and thousands of, um, of reactions a day and then, yeah. And so send if them out. 
if people can want to test it tomorrow, um, can they like? Is are you able to send them? Yeah, not tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going on vacances uh, today, so. Uh, <laughs> but uh, probably early September, we sh I hope we can send like a first batch out. So okay. could I just ask, what is the the volume of the template that you put in? So we've been just putting in one microliter of the RNA. Um, and I think it's better to do two microliters, actually. There was the one strip of eight where there was one tube that didn't show up. And I think our old Hecarium P20 giving one microliter isn't as reliable as it should be. <laughs> but yeah, we make a master mix and then it's usually just two microliters uh, that's free. So one microliter for one RNA, one microliter for the other RNA, for instance. Okay, it one. looks a little bit more than one microliter in those tubes though. Oh so no, the whole reaction is 20 microliters. These are 20 microliter reactions. Uh, okay, but if, the, if it's lyophilized and then you put in one microliter well, so you put in you put in you would put in eighteen of like a rehydration buffer, which is basically just the buffer water and magnesium, okay. and then two of the sample, or fifteen and five of the sample, or whatever. Uh, and the like the other important thing for the freeze drying is that you shouldn't have glycerol. In it, it, yeah. it makes it doesn't let it last well. Yeah. Otherwise, they, these tubes when they're all freeze dried, I was shocked at how well it works. But you know, two months later. With at room temperature, no problem. But we don't know if they go 40 degrees somewhere on their way to India, if this is yeah. going to be working well. Mm. So that's the real validation by collaborators that we're looking forward to. Yeah, I got a bunch of those silica packs now. Yay! Now I feel safer to send them out. <laughs> Andrew was asking what is needed to, to push this forward and faster, and how, how can we help? Well, I mean, knowing exactly the best combination of primers is, um, is key. I mean, we can do a lot of things in silico for deciding which primers will interact with each other in a bad way and maybe give you false positives, for instance. But um, until you test things empirically, you don't know what's the best. So, so far I've only done three viral targets. And so if we had like, you know, somebody testing all of the viral targets there are, it would be awesome. But yeah, we, that's part of the reason why we're just doing this in an open way and trying to have people help. Yeah. Have, we've heard some good things about the primers, the um, HMS one, is that what they're called? I think the ones most from of the people were calling them like ASE or something like that. Oh ah, yeah, ASE one. Yeah. But we, I haven't ordered those yet. Yeah. And in um, for NED, they've been making these color metric kits and making some suggestions of mixing two sets of primers together for two different targets, just in one reaction where they're just detecting by pH and. Um, they seem to think that's great, but uh, to me, yeah, it, it always, yeah, you always just have to try it. Sometimes it works really well. So that was a question from you, Andrew? Yeah, that was a question for me. I guess I can follow it up. I mean, is there, so um, the question would be, is there, is there any effort underway to basically put this through um, the sort of certification procedure that would be required? Um, I mean, I, I think you want to kind of finalize, for example, your primer design, as you just mentioned, um, or at least, you know, version 1.0, and then, you know, sort of have at least a kind of provisional, like, okay, this part is done and, and you know, now move forward. Um, from there, and I guess the question is, are you are you working on that? Are you interested in that? What's the yeah yeah? So so some of our colleagues, especially in America, um, I don't know if Sarah made it today, but um, they're they're looking into this um, the certification, the special EU A E A thing, and. Um, uh, 
I, I think we definitely would need more validation on the, with people with BSL-2 access. So that would be to have more um, people we can ship our, our test strips off to that have access to clinical samples that they know what's positive, what's negative, to revalidate um, with our kit would be really great. Yeah, so and the people I know the people in Sri Lanka are starting to do very similar stuff to this on real samples. And then we we're also thinking about in some different way, shape, or form, like applying to this X Prize, which might allow us to like that 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 the second point of the second stage of the X Prize is really testing on real samples. Yeah, yeah. So it might end up really being um, helping for commercialization from that sort of Scale up and things like that. <laughs> right. uh, so you're, you're looking for clinical samples in BSL2 labs, is that, is that correct? So that you can yeah, so to when, test it. When we have our first sets um, ready to start freeze drying, then we'll have some sort of form. And so everybody who wants us to ship things to them, um, then everyone can sign up and I mean right now we have at least eight different colleagues from different parts of the world that are interested in getting them but yeah if we had more people that were interested yes we would love to send things off and have them looked at. Okay great. Uh, I'm really sorry I have to run but like you can find me on the slack or on the joke or on the email or whatever. Yeah I'll Thanks share all the, the emails and the contact so, Guy, thank you very much, Guy, for being here and for your time. In. Sure. And I'll stop the screen share. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Oh, hi, Sarah. Bye -bye. So, Sarah made it. Maybe Sarah can tell us more about her attempts to get validating things for the, um, the real, uh, clin to do real clinical tests. Sarah, can you hear me? Hello. I'm trying to bring it back up here but anyway not sure I'm gonna get video um, but yeah so we are there's a hospital system in Paris that is willing to test um, our kit on patients so that's great but yeah we're we're really looking to have our our test validated soon um, yeah, I don't know. So I have a BSL-2 lab and I'm hoping to actually get CLIA approval and start testing patients actually at my lab as well. Yeah, that's a CLIA approval. That's what I was Something different, yeah. <laughs> so we need the EUA from the FDA and then we need the CLIA, we need all of these letters. And then in France also there, and in Germany, we have some um, doctors who are interested in getting our, our strips of tubes also to try. And I think Guy just mailed off a bunch of detectors to various people around the world. Does is, there, else is there any question? <laughs> any other question and comment? It's been really nice to see how so many people have gotten together because even in our Jogal group, there's a, a big academic group that come together from um, one guy, Chris Mason in New York. Or, yeah, I think he's in New York. And um, because of that, we've even met some of the people from the Vienna group <laughs> and, and the people that work at NEB also. So it's made it quite interesting for all of us to, um, pull on other people's expertise a bit. Yeah, well, would you be able to uh, quantify the number of people who have contributed to these projects so far? Do you have any well, idea? I'd be able to. I think Mark from Jogo could. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. Mark knows a lot of network. <laughs> but yeah, yeah um, do you... Go ahead, go ahead, Rachel. I was just going to say, we definitely have had a, a lot of um, people coming in and out and 
joining different groups and yeah i think it's going to be interesting to see how we pull together this x prize um application because we're still not exactly sure how we're going to do that but i think we have until the end of the month to decide yeah so uh, i would say if, wants if to join uh, <laughs> in the x prize <laughs> that's a great opportunity yeah, yeah nice. it's probably close to i would say like 150 people don't you think if we include the mason group i mean it's a lot of people who have been brought together yeah but i'm not not everyone from the mason group is like into the whole open science thing no I mean, they call it a pre-competitive space which makes me a little concerned sometimes like they're planning to compete afterwards <laughs> so, so some people actually do you know they hold things back they don't tell everybody because they want to have the big paper. That's academia. But that, that's been there. really amazing to see how, how this project evolved and how you keep on like making it open source and like providing all the tests for validation to like across continents. It's like when you, when you see how people are like in countries are restricted in terms of testing, um, like we're really hoping you can make a big change um, yeah, in the months ahead. Um, I'm a, Rachel, I'm, I'm remembering you mentioned a few other needs you have, such as people who uh, do know programming uh, to develop your website and also uh, people who could help with the shipping of tests for validation. So I'm just taking this opportunity, uh, if here you have anybody in your network, um, that could really coordinate, for example, the shipping from uh, from France or from Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be, I guess, really helpful, right? Um, and uh, also people who knows a bit about data management uh, of all of this. Uh, am I forgetting something, anything? I think that's the main thing, yeah. And also just, yeah, people in communications that want to try and spread the word more and um, help find more people that could really use this and, and get good answers for us for the validation. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, yeah. I just Sorry. saw one more person, Dimitri, just joined in with us and he was saying that he could do programming for us. So that's really good. And we have somebody else who already talked about the website too. But yeah, it would be really great to get um, sort of transdisciplinary teams together working in all, all these different things, which is what Hackwarium really tries to do. Um, because you never know when, when there's people with all sorts of different experiences working on things like this together, you get unexpected synergies and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, like transdisciplinary settings do, <laughs> do a lot of good. Um, I just, I'm trying to copy and paste a few of the contacts, but the links are not working in the chat. So I'm just going to refer you to the agenda and, um, where you can find at the end of it, all the contact information of the teams. You have the, the link to the slide deck. You have the link to join Drogo if you wish. Uh, it's a, like, uh, again, this platform is free and you can create collaboration. You can put your project and document it in an open science uh, fashion way. Um, so yeah, maybe before we close this call, um, can we have, we have a little tradition of having a group picture just so that we can remember the good memories. <laughs> I'm not, a, I'm personally not a big fan of it <laughs> because I'm, I'm not a big fan of pictures, but um, <laughs> if you, if you don't mind putting, turning on your video, giving us your best smile. <laughs> Should we wave? <laughs> Yeah, Thumbs we can up. wave. I can come down to three and we can take a, we can take a picture. Thanks All to right. everyone for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Ali, Abizari, Aaron, do you want to, Lenny, do you want to turn on your, your camera? Uh, sorry, I'm unable okay. to turn my camera. <laughs> no worries. Okay. All right. And then we count down to three and do you want to say hi in? <laughs> or oh, you can do any crazy face. You <laughs> three, two, one, hey. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
for. And if anybody wants to oh, talk I to me about I open science or genomic integrity or things like that, dynamics in the cells, I'd be very happy. <laughs> Can uh, sorry, can I ask you to do to do the picture again, please? Because uh, we just had a message popping up <laughs> in the picture. Sorry, <laughs> just one more try. Things don't always work the first time. We know that in science, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's Three. called research. <laughs> <laughs> Three, two, one. Hey, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks well, a lot, thank Jenny. you very much. Yeah, thank you to the whole uh, Corona Detective team uh, for your time and for the thorough presentation. And anyone here in this room who showed up, asked questions, um, I really hope that can lead to further collaboration. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. You, you normally you have all the information in the agenda. Uh, if you if you if you lost it, you can just like mention mm -hmm. us on Twitter or just on Jogo. Uh, you, you'll find us. So I wish you a very good end of day, wherever you are, and stay in touch. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. Ciao. Bye. Bye-bye.